The last time I spoke here, which was actually four weeks ago today, June 3rd, the day before Pentecost, uh, a part of the sermon I discussed some of God's wonderful attributes as being our Father. And I'm going to use that as a foundation uh, for the message today. <clears throat> and so I will, I'm just going to recap a little bit of what we discussed then and uh, with a few different scriptures, I think one or two of the same. And then I'll get to uh, the main part of the message. <clears throat> you know, God is uh, creating a family with us. And family is very important to God. <clears throat> and not only is he creating a family, the physical family that he created is the perfect family unit. He created the father slash husband, the wife slash mother, and the son and the daughter. And that's what I want to, want to discuss today. And actually, most of what I want to discuss is the most neglected role in that equation between the, the different family members. And it's a subject I'm very passionate about <clears throat> because my wife and I and our family has, have experienced both extremes of this subject. The title of the sermon is, Why a Daughter Needs a Dad. And I got that, that title from this book that our daughter gave me 14 years ago. This is one of the most prized gifts I've ever received. And rarely, it, it, almost any time, if not every single time I've ever opened it and read in it, it brings tears to my eyes. So it, on, on the surface, it may seem like this just affects subject just applies to the fathers and the daughters, but it doesn't. It applies to all of us. We're all either a father or a daughter or the son of a daughter who will then eventually be a father, most likely. So it applies to all of us. So let's, uh, I'll just refer, refer to 1 John 4, 8. I want to discuss a little bit about our father, our heavenly father, and that gives us men and fathers the role model that we should become like. So I'll refer, just refer to 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, where it says, he who, do, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That's, that's our job, is, is to be like our Heavenly Father, to love one another and to love our families. And uh, also, the next, uh, the next verse, you can turn to it if you would like, but I'm going to read it out of the Amplified it says uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Deuteronomy 7, 9 out of the Amplified Bible. Therefore, know without any doubt and understand that the Lord your God, who is our dad, he is God, the faithful God who is keeping his covenant and his steadfast loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. You know, that's the kind of dad we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be faithful. We're supposed to keep our covenants or, you know, our, our agreements what, that we make. We're to be steadfast and we're to have loving kindness. Uh, now let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, which is one that we turned to, I believe, uh, four weeks ago when I discussed this. That's Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. I love this verse. God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. We're starting to see a, a very loving picture of our, of our Heavenly Father. And uh, I've got, a, I think, a couple more scriptures here we'll, we'll read and then I'll get into the the main thing I want to discuss. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 38 and 39. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 38 and 39. And I'll read this out of the New King James. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What an example of a loving Heavenly Father, you know, the perfect Father, the kind that we, we all would like to have and the kind that we all do have if we obey Him and have His Spirit. <clears throat> So th this verse, it reminds me, it says, uh, Nothing shall be able to separate us, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing. It reminds me of when our, our son and daughter were little. We, we have two children, for those that don't know. Our daughter's the oldest, and, and then our son. And we're very blessed with both of them. One of these days, I'd like to give a, a sermon on why a son needs a dad. Uh, that'll, that'll be for another day. And my wife and I have been very blessed with the wonderful son and daughter. I, actually, our, in our son's yearbook, the, the uh, year he graduated from high school, the parents could put a little block in there to have printed in the book. And my wife and I had printed for Chris that we wish everybody could have a son like Chris. He's, Chris is he's pretty amazing. He's godly, uh, just... Uh, very meticulous at his work, uh, pretty amazing son. And the same thing with our daughter. They're a lot different. They're like, they're like polar opposites, but they're both wonderful. Okay, but uh, back to this first. You remember when you, you were little or your kids were little and, you know, God says nothing can separate you from my love. Do you remember saying, I love you this much, you know, as far as you can stretch your arms out, that's how much I love you? That's what we would tell our kids or... Sometimes we would say, I love you to the moon and back. That's what God's saying right here. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. And I'll be reading in the New King James, unless I let you know otherwise. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Again, uh, an excellent picture of a loving father. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And then I'll just refer to Psalms 103, verse 4. It says, Who redeems your life from destruction, so he's our Father, saves our life, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. And that reminds you of the scripture of the prodigal son, doesn't it? So, our job as fathers and men, it's our responsibility to reflect to our children the, the love of God. We're supposed to reflect God to our children. Unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of people have not had that, that proper role model as a father, so it's harder for them to connect with how God actually is. So men and fathers, we have a pretty tall order. And I challenge us all, including myself, to step up to the plate and, and uh, step up our game and be the father that we should be. And, and if we're already a good father, we can always be a better father. As I mentioned, this is one of the most treasured gifts I've ever received. And part of what it makes it so is that I'm sure you know, I remember when I was in even grade school, when Charles and I went to the feast together in Jekyll Island. And uh, I had to work on my homework, tra traveling to the feast, sitting in the back seat, and I've got the history book and whatever else I'm supposed to be studying in. And most of the time I'm actually looking out the window because I'm learning stuff there too, which traveling is, that's my story, traveling is a pretty good education in itself, but I didn't, uh, I didn't apply myself as much to the books as maybe I should have, but then maybe I did, you know. But, uh, but I remember what a challenge it was to take off for the feast and get back and then not be behind in class. And I don't, I don't know that that ever actually happened that way that I wasn't behind. I certainly doubt that it did happen that way. <clears throat> but then I know when when the young people graduate from high school and go off to college, it's even harder, you know, to, to stay caught up and go to the feast. And our daughter, when she bought me this book, it was, she, she did it shortly before the feast, was in law school. 
at uh, the University of Texas. And they really try to kick your tail there in law school and weed out the weak ones. And, uh, but Tiffany hung in there, but I really, really appreciated that in spite of that, before she took off for the feast, she took this book and she wrote personal messages to me on probably half of the pages in here about how each of these hundred reasons why a daughter needs a dad applies to our relationship. So here in a little bit, I'll, I'll tell you my, my top ten favorite reasons. And even though Tiffany lets her mother think that she's her mother's little girl, she's daddy's girl. And, and she promised me when she was a little girl that she would always be my little girl. And, and she uh, reaffirmed that here recently. And that's pretty nice. And if you, if you detect any blatant fatherly pride, I, I plead totally guilty. I'm, I'm very, very proud of our daughter and son both. I'm to the point here in my notes where I try to make my notes in, in large print so I can just glance down and see it. My computer kind of uh, pooped out on me <laughs> yesterday afternoon. I spilt something on it and then it's like, okay, I'm not doing anything now. <laughs> so, so I wasn't able to get this, the, the rest of this printed in, in a bigger type. But uh, So just bear with me if I have to look at, study my notes a little bit to... Uh, see what all I, I want to bring out. But as I mentioned, Tiffany and I have always been blessed with a very good relationship. And on the other hand, and, and one of the reasons, one of the main reasons this subject is so important to me and I'm so passionate about it, is my wife and I and our children have seen both ends of the spectrum. <clears throat> Linda never knew her dad until she was 33 years old. And I always really missed I miss Linda not having her dad, and I miss not having a father-in-law, and I missed our children not having their other grandfather. And you know, it really leaves a big hole, and I'm sure lots of you have experienced that. And, I, I, and I'm speaking also to the, the people uh, watching on webcast, and welcome, by the way, we always appreciate you joining us. But we never knew who Linda's father was, until she was 33 and then due to miraculous circumstances which I can prove mathematic the odds are like in the story are, are billions to one and uh, anyway we got a phone call that Linda's dad was E.M. Clayton in Lawrenceburg Tennessee or near Lawrenceburg Tennessee and so we found that out right after the feast in 1989 <clears throat> and we packed up Linda called and talked to him, and uh, she asked her dad if she could, if she could, my wife's wiping tears from her eyes back there, but she asked him if <clears throat> she could call him daddy, and he said yes. <clears throat> we loaded up the car, <clears throat> or yeah, the car, and we went up there within just a few days and met Linda's dad and her stepmother. And for anybody that might have been confused, Linda's biological mother, who lived with us for the last three and a half years, uh, who died in April, on April 15th, that was her biological mother. And then Linda's stepmother in Tennessee had the heart attack in open heart surgery uh, just two or three weeks later. So that's to clarify if anybody was confused about that. But anyway, we went up there and met Linda's dad and stepmother. And they were just the most wonderful people you could ever hope to meet. Uh, just down home, had worked really hard all their lives, you know, were, were broke when they were young, and over the course of his lifetime, he was able to accumulate, uh, you know, a fair amount of, fair amount of things and, and became pretty successful. <clears throat> but uh, come to find out, they were in the church all these years. It was, they, they attended the Worldwide Church of God at that time, that was in 1989. He was baptized by 
I think it was Rod, Rod Meredith and uh, his brother-in-law, Raymond McNair, I think in Snake Creek, there outside of Lawrenceburg, Tennessee in 1949. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, and then eventually in uh, 1993, I think it was, they went with Living Church of God. So uh, and, and June, Linda's stepmother still attends there. So I know this is this can be a very sensitive subject for some te some people, and uh, I, I think especially for those that have not had a relationship with their father or not had a good relationship with their father. And I sometimes think that maybe maybe a bad relationship is is harder than no relationship at all, e even though that's very hard. So this subject applies to fathers and their young daughters, fathers and their grown daughters, because nobody gets off the hook on this. It's, it's still us fathers, even though we have grown daughters, our example and our love to them is still very important. It applies to boys and young men who will one day be fathers, and it affects the relationship between a daughter and her son. So this subject replies, applies to everyone. And I, I was very struck by the fact that George W. Bush was asked what was the most important title he ever had. He said it was dad. It was the most important title he ever had. That's, that's a pretty good perspective. One thing that we fathers need to realize is that we are the introduction to our daughter to the opposite sex. And our, our example means a lot. It's, it, it has a profound impact on the future husband that our daughter will, will choose. And it will affect her relationship with her husband. Your relationship with your daughter is very instrumental in her development of self-respect and her requirements of how a gentleman must treat her. We husbands and fathers should treat our daughters from the time they're very little with, with a lot of respect. And, and teach them how, by our example, how a gentleman should treat her. And it's, it's a fact that most daughters will pick a husband similar to their father, even if it was an abusive relationship with her father. Even though it's painful, she's familiar with that. So it's our job to treat our daughter as a lady, as a young lady, and and show her by our example what a gentleman is. So she'll know when she sees one before she gets married. <clears throat> so my purpose today is to inspire fathers and daughters to build a very special bond. The first point I want to, want to discuss is the importance of the father's role. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your gates of your house and on your gates. So again, it's our job as fathers and, and men, even if you don't have a, a daughter or and, and maybe never will have, we'll, we'll discuss another category here, which is we're to be fathers to the fatherless. So even if you don't physically have a father, it's still our job as men to be a father to the fatherless. A daughter has a strong need for her dad's love. If a father does not show proper love and affection for his daughter, she will attempt to find it from another male, which is very prevalent in our society. When a father fails to show love and affection to his daughter, 
she will often become sexually promiscuous in order to gain acceptance from males. Actually, I want to share with you a, a, a video. I'll, I'll give, I, well, I can give you the link later if you ask me. Or, But if you go to YouTube and do a search on Dr. Megan, Meg, M-E-G, Meekin, M-E-E-K-E-N, she wrote a book titled Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters. That's Dr. Meg Meekin. Is it Meeker? Is it? Okay, I'm sorry, Meeker, M-E-E-K-E-R. Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters is the name of the book. And uh, I've, I've watched, I think, I think six of her videos, they were about, I think, about six minutes long each. Just excellent, and she really nailed the subject, and it's, it's the same thing as what we're discussing here. So by us fathers loving our daughters, it helps guide her to meeting, looking for and meeting the proper kind of husband like we would want her to have. So now to the book. Uh, I'm going to list my, it's a hundred reasons why a daughter needs a dad. They're, they're pretty much all very good. There's, there's a couple I might not agree with totally, but I'll read off my top ten. Why a daughter needs a dad. One, I'm working my way down from number 10 down to number, my number one. <clears throat> a daughter needs a dad so she will always know what it is like to be someone's favorite. Our, and our daughter Tiffany wrote in the book, that's the best part. A daughter needs a dad to be the safe spot she can always turn to. A daughter needs a dad to be the standard against which she will judge all men. And that's true. Your daughter is going to, to judge other men or boys by you. A daughter needs a dad to teach her what it means to always be there. You know, that's something that's, that's pretty lacking in our society. But the dad is the one thing the daughter needs to be able to, be able to count on. <clears throat> A daughter needs a dad to teach, to teach her that a man's strength, and this, this is a very important one. This reminds me, I cannot read this without thinking of Linda's dad. He was a very hardworking, kind-hearted, soft-spoken, humble man with high standards, high godly standards. <clears throat> a daughter needs a dad to teach her that a man's strength is not in the force of his hand or his voice, but in the kindness of his heart. A daughter needs a dad to hold her as she cries. A daughter needs a dad to set a moral standard for her. Our children look at us, they look at us and say, well, this is what dad did, so, you know, that's kind of within my wheelhouse. You know, if I do, kind of like maybe not even that good, but something close to that, maybe that's good enough. Well, it's not. It's our job to be like God and to set that example. A daughter needs a dad who will influence her life even when he isn't there. Like, you know, when, when our daughters go off to college and there's this temptation and that temptation, they need to remember that's not dad's standard and dad's standard is my standard. <clears throat> Another very important one, a daughter needs a dad to teach her by his example how to recognize a gentleman. So if she's, she's dating, she sees some boys and you know, they're rough and crude, and, and uh, she needs to realize, nope, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking, my dad set a godly, godly example, I'm looking for a godly gentleman. <clears throat> and then my, my number one favorite, which is actually, they're, they're all my favorites, but this is the culmination of the whole idea of putting this all together. My favorite one, a daughter needs a dad 
to stand with her on the day she marries the man that she hopes will be just like her father. And, and I have to say that our daughter picked a man, Dustin, that way surpasses me. He's a, I, I cannot imagine. I, I'm fond of saying he's, I'm sure he's the most wonderful son-in-law in the world. And, uh, and I've got to be careful what I say because I'm probably going to send this link to them. So I don't want to get beat up too bad. <laughs> and I'm going to throw in one more, too, just because I can't resist. A daughter needs a dad to be the one hero who will never let her down. There's a book, uh, another book I'll refer to as titled Always Daddy's Girl. It's written by H. Norman Wright. I'll repeat that in case anybody wants to look it up. Always Daddy's Girl by H. Norman Wright. W-R-I-G-H-T. -W this is on page 41. He, he points out that it is from a father that a girl needs to know that she's attractive. Don't just avoid that subject. And God, God made each of us, you know, in, in, in society there's fads that come and go and even in people's appearances, God created each of us exactly the way he wanted us. And we need to make sure as fathers that the girl is, that our daughters are comfortable with her appearance. God didn't make any mistakes. And we need to also make sure that, that we relate to her that her conversation is interesting and that her creativity is worthwhile. That gives her self-confidence in herself, and we need to give her confidence in God. But that goes a long way to a young lady meeting her, her calling, is being confident in the God-given abilities that she's been given. He goes on to say, if a father applauds her mental and spiritual attributes during her formative years, she will learn not to rely solely on shallow qualities of sex appeal to attract men as an adult. So if we do our job, our daughters are way, way more likely not to go down the wrong road. Affirmation from her father in proper doses will convince her that she is, as an, is an important person, not a sex, sex object. So we need to bring out the best in our daughter by a good example and by our godly instruction and by, and by encouragement. <clears throat> the definition of encouragement in Webster's Dictionary is to give courage, hope, or confidence, to embolden, to hearten, to help, give support to, be favorable, and foster. Most of the time when I hear that word foster, my last name, it's used in a negative way and it doesn't need to be that way. Like, you know, it fostered disagreement or, well, we need to we need to foster godly traits in our, in our daughters. So it's our job to give our daughters confidence in their abilities, in their God-given abilities. And we need to help her discover what her God-given abilities are. You know, God gives gifts to each of us, and we need to pay attention and love her and realize that, you know what, she does exceptionally well in this category, in that category, in that category and encourage her in that, not try to shoehorn our children into some dream we had of when we were kids that we didn't fulfill. That's, that day's gone, but this is about our daughters. We need to be very careful not to kill her spirit or, or don't tell her, well, you can never do such and such. I'd heard a story of DJ telling on the radio back here a few years ago telling about his daughter and how horribly she sang and that she could never sing and I thought that, that just broke my heart and I, I, I remember when Tiffany was was real young I've got to be careful what I say here because I may have to pay for it but she would go for some reason she'd go to the dirty clothes basket and she'd get out dirty clothes and hang around her neck and then she would sing and she was she was really young then and honestly, I thought, please let this stop. But I never said anything to her. I, I, I never wanted to, to quench her spirit. And she, she, can sing, she sings beautifully. She sings uh, at weddings and funerals and sings special music a lot and sings special music at the feast. She has a beautiful voice. So we don't ever, we don't ever want to, 
quell the enthusiasm of our daughters or children by saying, well, you can't do this or you can't do that. They can do anything they set their mind to it, anything God's given them the ability to do. <clears throat> when, when our son and daughter, from the time they were small, we always told them, you can do anything in life you want. You can accomplish anything all, as long as it pleases God, number one, and you work and earn it. I heard a story uh, here a while back about this little girl named Annie, and uh, her uncle <clears throat> was talking to her, and, and uh, she was ready to go to bed, and, and her uncle says, Annie, uh, you're the smartest little girl there is. And she goes, I know that. <laughs> and then he said, and you're the most beautiful little girl I know of. She said, I know that too. And he said something like, and I think you can do anything. She said, I know that, I can't. And he said, the uncle said, how do you know all that? She said, because my daddy tells me every day. <laughs> well, that's what us daddies should do. One of the best things we can do for our daughters and, and, and our sons too is to love their mother. Our children need to know that we're, we're in love with their mother. And make sure that your daughter realizes to the core of her being that you love her deeply and cherish her. Show your daughter affection daily. Our, our son and daughter would always call it the dad pat. You know, I, I, can't, I can hardly walk by them without reaching out and, and patting them. Give her, give her plenty of hugs and kisses every day. You know, we need to, we need to tell our, our daughters and sons both that we love them, but we also need to back that up with action. You know, it's, love is an action. Otherwise, it's just a hollow, meaningless waste of a breath. We fathers also need to make sure that we validate our daughters. They have a strong need for that, and that's, that's referred to uh, in the video that I mentioned to you. And in the, in the, I haven't read the book. I just watched the videos, but i be quite sure it's in the book. We need to make sure that our daughters realize their invaluable worth to, to us and to Almighty God. And I'll, re, I'll repeat this one, one point from this book, a man's strength is, is not in the force of his hand or in the power of his voice, but in the kindness of his heart. And I realize with our daughter, pretty early on, she's always been strong-willed, which is good if it's channeled in the right direction, but I always found it was more effective in, instead of saying, you will do this, because that didn't really work that well, but she's a pretty smart girl. And if I nudged her in the right direction, then she'd pretty much always figure it out and go in that right direction. We also need to expose our hearts to our children. It's, you know, we're, we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. But if we try to put on this air to our children that we're perfect and you're not, that's not going to work well for either, either of us. But what does work well is when we admit our mistakes and we expose our heart, and, 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 and apologize to our children when we need to. That endears us to our children and to, to our, our wives. <clears throat> we also need to teach our daughters that, I, I mentioned about letting them know they're beautiful physically, give them confidence in their physical appearance, but we also need to let them know that the greatest beauty of all comes from right inside. Nothing's more beautiful than, than the heart. And we need to catch her, catch her doing good, catch her doing the right things. If that's a lot more effective than just standing by, you know, just kind of bypassing, you know, the good things that they do and, and just watching to catch them doing something wrong and then correct them for it. And they tend to gravitate, you know, what, what we focus on and what we give life with words, they tend to gravitate toward that and, and go to that. So the most effective thing we can do is, like I mentioned earlier, compliment them on their good traits, encourage them in that, and then compliment them 
on the good things that they do. And they will tend, because they, they want to please us dads, and, and the compliments will cause them to want to aspire to do even better. A few years ago on this subject, I independently asked my wife and our daughter and a dear friend of ours the same question, exactly the same question. Neither one of them knew I was asking the other one. It was a different time. And all three of them, my wife, our daughter, and our friend, gave me exactly the same answer. The question is, what is the most important thing a daughter needs to know from her dad? They each independently said exactly these words, that their dad is proud of them. That goes a long way. And it, it, it's good to tell other people, but it's not good enough. You know, we, we, can, we can tell you know, whoever that you know, I'm proud of my daughter, and I am proud of our daughter, but I also need to tell her. That's the most important part. She needs to hear it from me that I'm proud of her. Your daughter's like a plant. Uh, I don't think this is a real plant here. If it was, you know what it, what it has to have to live? The same thing everything alive has to have, water. Our daughters need to be watered with our love and affection or else they'll die. They'll just shrivel up. Just, just like a, a live plant would. I know of an account where uh, a young daughter would get dressed up from time to time in a real pretty dress for some special occasion and she would ask her dad to take a picture of her. And you know why she wanted him to take a picture? She just wanted to hear him say that she was pretty. Unfortunately, she never heard that. It's important that we tell our daughters how pretty they are. <clears throat> and we need to treat them, treat our daughters like a lady. And uh, I took our daughter, we lived uh, in Hickory Creek, Texas, just north of Louisville. And, uh, when our daughter and son were in elementary school there. And I got to take our daughter to her first dance, the daddy-daughter dance, and brought her her first corsage. And I highly recommend that. And we, sh we should go on dates. We fathers should go on regular dates with our daughters. Uh, you know, just the two of us, you know, just us and them. And if you have more than one daughter, then rotate maybe the next week, do it with another daughter. And it's good to do that with our son, too. I mean, with our sons. And uh, I have to tell you a little experience. A year ago or two years ago, I think two years ago, uh, I went to visit them out of state. And we have a little grandson who's now eight. He's my little redheaded buddy. And then we have a granddaughter that's six. And so I took each of them to the yogurt place for like a little papa daughter papa granddaughter dance or I mean uh, date and it was interesting because I took our grandson first and they had their they on the tables at the yogurt place they had I think it was a checkerboard where you could sit there and play checkers so Ben and I played checkers or whatever the game was while we ate and Ben's all boy and then <clears throat> a different time I took our granddaughter there who was she would have been about I think she was four at the time we're sitting there, it's a totally different experience from taking our grandson and taking our granddaughter. And Addie and I are sitting there eating the yogurt and she turns around, she sees this young lady come in the door and she's just in awe. She just, she didn't take her eyes off this young lady. She was wearing a beautiful long dress and Addie just sit there, all girl, she just, she's just eating up this dress this lady had, just studying this woman. And I told our, our daughter when, when Addie and I got back home that, that it was a totally different experience taking Ben and taking Addie to the yogurt place. And Tiffany goes, yeah, I know, we hear that all the time. <laughs> what, what a, how different they are is, you know, the boys compared to the girls. So our dad, uh, us as dads, we are our daughter's first courtship. We need to get it right and again, show them how gentlemen should treat them. 
we need to instill the fact in, in our daughters that she is a, a well-able child of God. And something else important is, you know, as our daughters enter puberty, it's, it's, uh, it becomes awkward for the, for the father. It's like, you know, I don't know how to act. Do I still hug her? What do I do? What you do is you, you love her just like you always have. And this, this was a uh, big news flash to me. I discussed this with our daughter a few years ago. Big news flash. It's awkward for the daughter, too. She's, she's never had her body develop like that before. So, you know, it's a little awkward for, for both, maybe, but you still love your daughter just like you always have. And then uh, another, another point is the importance of the daughter's role. Just like... In this book, Tiffany did uh, just what Deuteronomy chapter 5 says, that she honored her father by the things she wrote in this book. So it's important that daughters do honor their fathers. <clears throat> also, maybe you're a grown daughter and you've never had a relationship with your dad or never had a good relationship. Maybe it would, would be good. It takes two, pe two people to have a relationship, but maybe it would be good and helpful if you would, even though maybe he's got lots of faults like we all do, if you complimented him on his good traits and start there. And uh, I've, I've got a story here about someone that did that and it was very effective and they developed a, a wonderful relationship. But uh, <clears throat> 10 years ago, we got a call from, from Tennessee that Linda's dad and stepmom were both really sick and we loaded up the truck and went up there for an undetermined period of time and uh, during, during the course of that nine days uh, in 12 hospital and doctor visits, we discovered that he had colon cancer. They told me he, he would have a good two years, <clears throat> which turned out to be pretty, pretty correct. Uh, eight years ago, and we, we went up there frequently during that period of time. Eight years ago, <clears throat> we got the call on a Friday that he didn't have much time left. <clears throat> so Lynn and I loaded up the truck and went up there got there at 2 o'clock in the morning and Linda's stepmom told her that her dad uh, wrote her, Linda's stepmom, a love note. He was laying there in bed, emaciated, you know, barely able to talk. And uh, she said, he wants to write you one in the morning. So the next morning, Linda's dad wrote her a love note. And this is the note right here. It just says love. By that time, that's all he was able to write. He wrote love, and then he pointed to Linda and pointed to me. Uh, <clears throat> three days later, Linda's dad died, laying there in the bed in the living room. And Linda never got to cuddle up with her dad <clears throat> when, when uh, she was a little girl. She never knew him until she was 33. When he died, <clears throat> Linda instinctively <clears throat> got up in the bed and cuddled up next to her dad. You know, once he, he had, by then, he had, I'm sure, qualified to be in God's kingdom and uh, awaits the resurrection. So, as fathers, we all need to make sure that we truly love our daughters and uh, we can have a great relationship with them and, and uh, it will pay, that relationship will pay off huge dividends more and more as the years go by. And now Wayne Woodring is going to come up and sing a song that he wrote for his daughter. Uh, it's a wonderful song, and Tiffany and I were privileged to, for Wayne to play it and share Jennifer's song with us for Tiffany and I's father-daughter dance at her wedding. And I really appreciate Wayne being here. He had 12 oxen in the ditch last night. He was hauling... 12 head of cattle down from Missouri and the axle was coming off of his trailer and uh, he got home, got it fixed and got home, I'm not sure when, 1 or 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock this morning. So thanks a lot for coming, Wayne.
something comes after this. Maybe. Hopefully I've got this set up okay. together 